Okay, so thank you everyone for coming once again to the seminar. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce Frederick Anders, who did his PhD in postdoc, uh, one year of postdoc there, and then moved to Barcelona again as doing his second postdoc, which he's been there for like five years now, I think. And well, all over to you. Thanks. Mm. So uh, I'm happy to see so many people. Actually, I changed the, t the title of my talk that I originally wanted to give because I thought, okay, I'm going to an institute that is full of cosmologists and, and, and people doing real physics. And so <laughs> I, I cannot just talk about uh, open clusters. Nobody will come. <laughs> so it, it seems that it worked. <laughs> now you're trapped. <laughs> you cannot go away. <laughs> okay. So, but anyway, uh, if anything is unclear, I try to, uh, because we had Francis Zinia in the cafeteria. Uh, and if you, some of you fall asleep, it, uh, you're perfectly, uh, I'm okay with that. Huh? You're all allowed to sleep. It was very good. <laughs> um, so, the title of the talk is something to do with machine learning, and maybe that's why uh, it's like 90% male audience, but uh, so I'm also sorry for that. Maybe I should give another title to that. But, um, I hope you still enjoy it though. Um, and it's a bit of a summary, so I'm going to uh, put three science cases um, that have something to do with machine learning that maybe you can also use for your types of your other types of research. But uh, I'm going to show some examples from Gaia and, and stellar, stellar astrophysics. Um, so just a few words where I come from. I'm working in at the University of Barcelona. There are some uh, other universities in Barcelona than the University of Barcelona. But if you ever get stranded at the airport in Prat, then it's not far to come to us. So. And there's also the coffee is cheap, and uh, and <laughs> and uh, there's also people working on primordial black holes. So, um, <laughs> other than the ones just working on Gaia, and in the Gaia group, um, ah, the institute is here. Um, and if you want to take your parents to Sagrada Familia, it's almost on the way. <laughs> Barcelona Sands is here. It's 15 minutes from Sands. That's where I live also. Yeah. If you are in Sands, then you can also write me an email. <laughs> it's going to be easier. So, uh, and these are the people working in our, in our group. Um, half of them are engineers. So software engineers or actual engineers uh, working on the Gaia processing mostly. And the other half is uh, scientists. But in the scientists part, we are also working on other uh, on other projects, big, large projects, European projects, because Gaia is at some point going to end, right? So probably we could call it something else in two years. Yeah, who knows? And then the, this group is embedded in a larger institute, which I think is a bit similar to uh, could be a bit similar to Center. If you go to the website, this is what it looks like. Um, so they're working on, uh, they're, they're people working on gravitational waves. They're particle physicists, nuclear physicists, um, and astrophysicists. And so, so uh, sometimes it's hard to, for us to uh, even recognize each other on the, <laughs> uh, when we go to the cafeteria. So I was wondering, and that's what I wanted to ask you, how do you organize? <laughs> And it seems to work like you're all here. So um, I'm very, uh, yeah, I would be interested to hear how you, how, how you actually maintain the connection within the different groups. Um, and the first idea that we had, because yeah, at our institute, this has not always worked as well, uh, was to organize a workshop that took place uh, one month ago, not even one month ago on machine learning. And then we noticed that uh, in each of the different fields, there are people working on uh, using machine learning for their for their research. And so this is just uh, some screenshots from this uh, from this 
um, workshop was two days. Um, each talk was half an hour, and so the, so there weren't many people. So there maybe thirty, um, but it was very very useful for the for the institute and uh, very nice. And so that's why I basically adapted the talk that I gave there to and and give a bit of different uh, talk here. But uh, as you can see, uh, it sometimes it's good to talk to to other people. <laughs> um because first uh you just get inspired you don't have, actually have to collaborate or not right but you just get inspired by different uh views on and maybe you have similar mathematically similar problems that you that you are using uh, that you are trying to solve and so uh coming to astronomy uh, as you can see this is the number of papers per month published in in, a, in on ADS that are on the astrophysics database system, that includes something like machine learning or artificial intelligence, and it's like exploding, right? Um, so that's where we are in right now. Fifty abstracts containing uh, machine learning per month, and in the title, it's uh, thirty. Okay. So. <laughs> And um, um, to give you a bit of context, where I, uh, why I'm, I don't know. Yeah, I, I started my PhD in 2013, right? That's when this book came out, and this turned into something like uh, my uh, personal Bible that I always had on the desk. And you could just open it and think, ah, but no, <laughs> nobody has used this technique, or in astrophysics, or in that part of astrophysics that I was working on uh, yet. So you could just and the good thing there was, this book came together with a Python package, and uh, and all the figures in the book were reproducible, so you could just copy the code, and put in your data, and obtain a result that had some meaning. Um, and now there's the second edition, so uh, it's called Statistics, Data Mining, and Mach and Machine Learning in Astronomy. Okay, so I'm just putting this here. Uh, so that uh, so that you maybe for the older people, uh, that's how how people get thrown into this field, right? As I was when uh, ten years ago. <laughs> um, what because you don't start with programming, you you have to you start a project, start a PhD, and then you you will just have oh yeah, you should work on this machine learning stuff. Oh, get a set of parameters for millions of stuff. Oh. So. Uh, this is the typical cartoon that you that you see uh, on Reddit about this phenomenon, right? Um, because you have to jump several steps <laughs> in between before actually. Like, well, that's that's the typical learning curve, right? You go up straight to the <laughs> into the very deepness of this field, uh, and so. Maybe I just leave these resources for some of you here that are interested in that. Um, okay, why is astronomy particularly interesting um, in terms of applications of machine learning? Because there are so different, so many different types of data. Um, in this review by uh, Luke and Jacobs that came out three years ago, so it's already outdated, but. Um, this is still true, right? We have images, we have spectra, we have catalogs, we have light curves, time series, simulations. Uh, so these are these are the typical types of data. So they are very can be very different, and the type of analysis that is best for each of those data types or combinations thereof uh, is of course also different. And then. Uh, Fluke and Jacobs also proposed that there are seven types of astronomical problems. Um, three that are the typical machine learning uh, standard textbook ones, which are classification, regression, and clustering. And then uh, something that's called forecasting. So you try to uh, predict whether the sun uh, will emit 
solar wind next week or if peter juice is going to explode uh, in the next century then sometimes you also want to create missing data uh, so this is generation and oftentimes you want to discover things that you don't know that you're going to want to discover um, so yeah uh, so this is kind of outlier um, outlier analysis problem and in the end uh, of course, this is also common to other fields. You want to generate some physical insight or insight about the machine learning uh, technique that you're using. Okay, now this is still very abstract, and I think it's probably also true for other problems in physics. This type of um, this type of uh, matrix that you know, in the end you can generate, right? So this is. Uh, you can try to match the different types of data with the different problems. And then uh, you see that astrophysics is quite rich in, in the sense that um, within the last decade or so, people have been using these different techniques on different types of data. And this is, uh, this is in 2020, maybe some of the some of the combinations have been filled by now also and um, from the computational side you can uh, think of also different types of problems right uh, simple statistics um, everything that involves a calculation of distances between two data points that is called generalized n-body problems and each of those seven computational problems scale differently with the number of objects and um so yeah this is also i'm gonna, I'm gonna jump over this slide but it's just that you see that yeah if people say the word machine learning or it, it basically doesn't mean anything at the beginning <laughs> if you don't want to fit it with some concrete application mm, so so what I want to talk to you about today is are these orange dots here. So three science cases um, that are quite uh, typical, okay? And so there, there are some expertise in our group in Barcelona, but probably you also have in, uh, in Andres' group some expertise on, on, on those and other techniques. So uh, um, if you are, I don't know, became curious, uh, maybe you want to talk to Andrea <laughs> about some, 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 uh, well, I don't know, <laughs> some project we might have in, in gravitational lensing. <laughs> um, okay, so first, uh, and I had to put this in uh, for the, for the cluster group, uh, the Gaia open cluster sensors. Mm. So this is so this is going to be mainly based on the Gaia, uh, only based on the Gaia catalog. Okay, so um, what we do is we have a huge we have a huge catalog of data, two billion, two billion uh, objects, and then several hundreds of rows, no columns. <laughs> so um, and then and then you're overwhelmed by this amount of data right and one uh, very obvious application is to find over densities in these in this catalog um, and often they correspond to actual physical structures so uh, physically or gravitationally bound objects or loosely bound objects and um, most of them will be open star clusters in our Milky Way galaxy um but still yeah we, now we could argue i think two two more days about what is actually an open star cluster i'm going to skip this question but do you think this is an open star cluster who thinks this is a cluster who thinks this is not huh? uh, no wrong <laughs> wrong formulation <laughs> who thinks this is a cluster an open cluster, an open cluster. which one the one on the right the big one. Hi. 
one, two, three, four. Okay, Andre. Exactly, it's an extinction. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so yeah, if you just look at in two dimensions on the sky, uh, then you cannot really tell uh, in many cases whether you are actually dealing with an open classes. Um, you can, however, easily find them in the five dimensional astrometric space that uh, Gaia will give you, which is not just the coordinates on the sky, but also the proper motions and the parallax, so the distance. And uh, so in, in proper motion space, um, just by looking at the Gaia DR2 data without any um, machine learning, even you, uh, you were, were able to identify uh, old, uh, well-known open clusters, as well as new, uh, new open clusters that uh, hadn't been uh, hadn't been detected because the proper motion uncertainty uh, in the previous catalogs are were just order of magnitude bigger, and so you don't find this this over density there. And then, uh, what you what Gaia can also do then is uh, give you these uh, color magnitude diagrams, so uh, Aspen Russell diagrams. If you go back in your, uh, to your undergrad, maybe then uh, you will remember these. And, and these are sequences with of of stars with um, the same age and the same metallicity. Okay. Um, so this is like a, a textbook example of uh, things where you can apply clustering algorithms to. Okay. And so, so several groups uh, then started to to do this. Um, and this is an application of a very simple uh, method, Gaussian mixture model with uh, k-means on top, um, where where Andre was also involved uh, by Tristan Cantal Gudin, who was my uh, office mate for for two years. Um, and so you just you just look at this distribution and and try to approximate it by a sum of Gaussians, and then you see one Gaussian that has a lot of weight and uh, uh, and is very very thin and then you associate this to a cluster and then uh, you take a second step in which you confirm your candidates by uh, comparing their distribution to a random uniform distribution of objects in the in the in this five dimensional space and in this case uh, this uh, this candidate was clumpier than random, so it's uh, always deemed to be a, a cluster. Mm. Then, then in our uh, in our group we had a very good uh, PhD student who who <laughs> wrote uh, and who started at the right moment in time <laughs> uh, with all this new this big new catalog at his hands, um, and then just applied. Uh, DB scan, a very simple um, clustering algorithm to the full uh, Gaia data set. Um, verified then uh, the, the, the found clusters with a neural network that was trained on, on uh, by, that was trained by human, by humans basically. So, um, I was one of the five humans that said, okay, this color magnitude diagram looks like a cluster. Um, and so, so he found uh, in total more than 1,000 new open clusters in those two, in, in this Gaia data from Gaia DR2 and the next data release DR3. And this is what they look like. They can be quite sparse even, so uh, below 30 member uh, stars. But their most of their most of their color magnitude diagrams look quite uh, nice, and and they are very very peaked, sharp peak distributions in the in the proper motion plane. Uh, and so we are gradually filling the galactic plane with newly discovered open clusters. Okay, this is just uh, yeah, thanks to the 
exquisite data quality, basically. If you want, you can even find them by eye. You just go through the data, uh, and but you need a lot of time <laughs> to do that. Sorry, every dot in these images, or because it's yeah. a it's a star. No, it's a cluster. It's a cluster. These are no, yeah, yeah. These are not clusters. Okay. Um, and the lines are the arms. The lines are the supposed uh, spiral arms. Yeah, that the traditional. Traditionally, people think that they are there. Let's see, um, if you zoom out a bit, um, so the the newly found clusters in this in this paper in this uh, second paper, I think, are the black dots here, uh, and the the old ones are this are this is this red distribution. So yeah, you can see that there are spiral arms, and the the galactic centers here to the right, um, and the sun is in the middle, of course. No? So uh, you found thing you find things that are close to the sun, but mostly also uh, in within three four kiloparsecs. Where do you find <laughs> Good questions. <laughs> <laughs> they are not obvious, right? Um, and and here you can see that maybe maybe these two things are spiral arms, but they are. They are not connect. I mean, the, in between that, we are sure that there are not no open clusters that trace the spiral arm. So the nature of the spiral arm is like it's a whole topic for a different talk. <laughs> but yeah, um, you have to want to see them. Has all the clusters that have been designed and not just the young ones, right? So it's the most exactly the ones. Yeah. Can we see them select a subsample of the young ones? True, yeah. They move away from the spiral arms yeah. as they get older. Um, but still, most of the open clusters are below one giga year, so uh, redshift 0, 0.0 something. Um, so yeah, they are. Um, they should be tracing the spiral arms if you look at it, more or less. Um, so the next step, um, okay. So from once you have detected this, the your your object of interest in this case open cluster, you want to characterize them to be then do some astrophysics with them. Um, in particular, you want to look at say the age distribution um you want to have precise distances for them um you want to know at which, which extinctions in between the cluster and and the sun and so these are this is also a possible application for for uh, some machine learning methods and because you can learn this from the from the shape of this platform russell diagram of your cluster um so the the distribution of member stars uh, in the color magnitude diagram should tell you something about these, these things. And then if you also know the parallax from Gaia, then you, you almost have the distance. Um, so this also helps to constrain this curve. And that's what we did in, in, in this paper. Basically, we uh, trained, uh, trained this uh, artificial neural network um, on these images of color magnitude diagram um, of real clusters for which we had those labels already determined with classical methods at the isochron fitting and uh, and then also simulations. So mixture of simulations and real data. And so this this works quite well. And then this <laughs> um, and another thing that I probably also want to mention is that uh, Gaia also allows us to to confirm or not whether previously detected open clusters, like uh, the one that I showed you in the beginning, um, are actually there or not. And so, what you can see here is the this is uh, based on, on this is from two thousand eighteen, basically two thousand twenty. Okay. So these black dots are the Gaia confirmed clusters 
and these other open symbols here, these were uh, conjectured or were previously discovered objects that Gaia cannot uh, cannot find. Oh. Hmm? Well, the conclusion is that um, well, if you look if you look at this blue distribution, then your conclusion about the structure of the Milky Way would be a different one. Okay, so the scale height uh, the scale height of the disk would be different. Uh, the, probably the stuff or the cluster formation uh, history in the inner parts would be different, etc. So this has some uh, has some severe implications on the dynamics of the disk. If you find them or not. Sorry, mm -hmm. If you choose one of these and they get a skull, how they get a skull? They measure what? Um, well, they are based on, uh, they were, so th these discoveries were based on purely photometric data. Um, so they didn't have the proper motions. They just looked at infrared uh, photometry and found over densities there. And uh, and in some places and sometimes even used uh, some uh, Schmidt plates. So from very ancient that. times, where you have uh, effects on the on the on the edges of the plate, where you have distortions, and then uh, and then this can affect your your okay. your view. And also one one thing is that if you were write a paper about uh, new clusters, you want to discover something. I think <laughs> so. Yeah, <laughs> you try to then you tend to be more generous than you probably should. And um, and then in some cases, so some uh, some of those objects, so these red ones, they have uh, names that are NGC something. Okay, so <laughs> they are there since the nineteenth century. New a new galaxy catalog. And they were not confirmed by I. They were not confirmed, and they were some of them were doubted before, but nobody would write a paper about that, right? So, so um, maybe it's just in some in some in some sentence in the appendix of some paper. <laughs> but maybe it's worth noting that some objects, I, I mean, most of them are not are obviously they don't exist, but some of them might be just be too far for the current data. Uh, so this is this is true for the for the inner for the inner disk so where Gaia cannot see and the infrared service actually have uh, have an advantage because they can just see through the dust but these objects at high latitude uh, we should be absolutely seeing them. And the fact that you see more uh, high latitude that further away from the disk is that observational or is that no? This is real. This is called the uh, the flare of the disk, and and also you see a hint of the warp, which means that that in this part the galaxy tends to or the galactic plane goes a bit down. Um, and this flare is because of the uh, because of the lower gravitational potential there, so the the objects can move further away from the from the plane. Um, okay, <laughs> so how am I going with time? Probably. Okay. So, hmm. so, so I just want to say maybe one conclusion um, that the hard work is not finding the candidates, but uh, interpreting them and and. Uh, and making sure that they are well vetted. I think you know that. <laughs> um, okay. And so, uh, yeah. So this is how it actually starts. Is how this this 2020 paper started. <laughs> this time was looking at those uh, at this object, for example, and then he found he tried to find it in Gaia, and he said, "Oh no, it's actually not a not a cluster. It looks like a cluster just because they're by chance." five stars that are right on the same uh, in the same spot in the sky okay mm, okay i'm going to try to go quickly here um a second 
A second uh, science case would be, okay, we have one point something billion stars in Gaia um, detected. We have their motions, etc. Now we also want to have stellar parameters for them. Um, so stellar parameter estimation for like this huge data set is also a very active field, let's say. Um, and this, of course, is not uh, okay. So this is a bit of a mentira, huh? this picture, because it's an, an external galaxy <laughs> with uh, spectroscopic paint data of the of the Milky Way painted on top, for which we know the ages. But so just a, so you get the idea that there's also some some physics inside it that is not stellar, okay? Because this age distribution is not. It's not just uh, stellar evolution, it's a galactic evolution. Um, okay, and so now this is the combination of methods and uh, and data types that I wanted to uh, show you. So some spectroscopic data and uh, then catalog data from Gaia. So this is a complex slide, but the idea is Mm. For some stars in the galaxy, actually now many millions of stars, almost 10 million stars, we have very good stellar parameters from spectroscopy um, by these multi-object spectroscopic surveys that are distributed over um, various countries in the, in the world. And they keep observing many, many stars, taking spectra. And for those, we know uh, very good temperatures, um, surface gravities, and so their position in the diagram, their distances, their extinctions, etc. And on the other side, we have um, data from Gaia for more than 300 million stars uh, with enough quality, and ex also additional photometry from the infrared, from uh, from, the, from the near infrared, from the far, uh, from the mid infrared, and from other optical surveys that we could in principle try to obtain the same type of uh, precision for those for those more than 300 million stars if we train a neural network to learn this com this this uh, basically the com <laughs> how to translate gaia plus photometry into into the output desirable parameters that are uh, Let's say temperature, extinction, distance, etc. And um, and so this was our first attempt uh, two years ago. Uh, on the left, you see the training data, uh, the test data. And on the right, you see the uh, training data, just using a simple um, multi-layer perceptron neural network. Um, you see on the top. Um, so-called spectroscopic hasbrun russell diagram or Kiel diagram temperature versus log G. And on the bottom, this is a classical column magnitude diagram. And um, so this seems to work uh, quite well, considering that we don't have on the, in the right, uh, in the right part here, we don't use spectroscopic data at all. Mm. Okay. So that, that's something you can do. And then uh, we were overtaken by the latest guy data release that also produced um, very re low resolution spectra um, for, for 220 million objects. So that's what they look like. So this, uh, if you translate them into observable uh, space, this is what the spectra would look like. And so you see that there's also some information, at least for temperature and gravity and, and metallicity there. So temperature is, is color coded here. So if you have this, spec this spectrum, then you know what temperature more or less the star is going to be. And um, uh, in this Gaia data release, the low resolution spectra are given as, as tables with coefficients. So you can just treat them. Um, as tabular data, and then think about okay, if you're, if I want to do the same experiment, I want to obtain uh, good parameters for for many many stars. Uh, what method? 
what machine learning method should I use? And then uh, we um, looked at this paper by accident and found that uh, they had actually benchmark tested um, different regression algorithms um, on tabular data of various, so various test data sets or various benchmark data sets. And so uh, the one that comes out very, very nicely in terms of both accuracy and, and training time is this uh, XG boost with this, which is some kind of uh, random forest on acid, right? So it's very, it's <laughs> on speed, let's say. <laughs> okay. Um, so it works very well. Um, and so actually astronomy was one of the first fields where this algorithm has been used a lot. So it was first published in 2016, but already like two years later, it's been all over the place in, in classification uh, uh, tasks, basically. So uh, in astronomy, we do lots of cl uh, classification. Right? So this is a galaxy, this is a star, this is a variable star, this is not a variable star, etc. cetera. Um, but then um, some uh, sometime later, it's also been it had also been used for for regression, and it works quite well. So you can use it for uh, photometric redshifts, for example, um, so when you don't have a spectrum and you still want to obtain the the recession speed of your galaxy, the number of sunspots, or uh, in this case, you obtain stellar ages just by looking at the spectroscopic properties of the star. Um, okay, so that's what we uh, what we were testing then, and it's still to be <laughs> um, to be uh, published. So we the thing is that now with the with the lower resolution spectra from Gaia, you can get much better metallicities, and also um, this is now working for white dwarfs um, and other so. Of course, the bigger, the, the, the more holistic you want to make your method work, the more training data you have to feed in, right? So, sorry, I'm starting to lose you. Uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> Too specific. Okay, okay. <laughs> okay, let, let me take a step back then. Uh -huh. <laughs> because maybe, I mean, Stellar parameters. <laughs> Who's interested in stellar parameters? Let's let's look at the more interesting problem from the conceptual point of view, hmm. which is, um, who of you have heard of chemical tagging? No. Okay. Yeah, well, okay. <laughs> Anna. Oh, <wait. Thank> you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, what is the the idea behind chemical tagging? And then. Uh, then I'm going to ask you if you think it's uh, it could work. Um, so if you just have the, the the spectrum at a sufficiently high resolution of a star, let's say it looks like this, and then you have another stellar spectrum, and you know that each of this each of the lines in the spectrum corresponds to some certain element, so you can. Uh, you can compute from the spectrum uh, the abundance of that element in the photosphere of the star. Mm. Now the question is, can you just by looking at the spectrum find uh, find out where the star was born? This is this is the this is the idea of chemical tagging. Okay, and there are two versions of chemical tagging. One is uh, weak chemical tagging, which says Okay, I look at the spectrum, I have the abundances of the stars. I know more or less in that galaxy uh, at which radius from the galactic center it was born and uh, at what age, what time, okay? That is called the weak chemical tagging, but the, uh, yeah, the initial idea was a strong chemical tagging, which is, okay, I look at two stars, and 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 see that they have similar, very very similar abundances, and they so they have been born in the same cluster. So can I infer uh, stars with the same birth 
uh, cloud. Like they, they formed from the same um, giant molecular cloud, okay? So who of you uh, think that strong chemical tagging can work? Oh, okay, three, okay, good. <laughs> That's why we're in science, right? <laughs> why, why shouldn't it work? <laughs> it's good. Um, all right. So, so the, uh, you could find, uh, say, say you do find two stars with the same composition. Can they be really separated within the galaxy, like in distance from the center? Mm, if they have the same composition, yes. Um, you could think that maybe one was born on this side and the other on the other side, and uh, and with by symmetry reasons there was a similar cloud on the other side. Okay. Theoretically, no. <laughs> um, so yeah. It, yeah. Uh, okay. So why why would this work in the first place? Is because um, different chemical elements trace different um, different nucleosynthetic uh, channels, right? So by comparing uh, the elemental abundances from one uh, from one element to another, from one star to the other, maybe it's or it's in principle possible to say, okay, this star um, uh, in, its, in the composition that reached to its birth cloud, there were more two, uh, supernovae type 1a that exploded than in the second star, for example, okay? Mm -hmm. This is how this works. And, um, and so there are several papers on this uh, notion of weak chemical tagging. So what you do is you observe uh, stars that are now in the solar neighborhood. You take the spectrum and then with uh, some inversions that may be valid or not, uh, you can infer uh, if you also have the age of the star from isochrones or so. So you have the age and the, and the abundance, then you can infer the birth position. If you if you assume something about the chemical evolution of the galaxy, uh, some basic things. Okay? For example, it always had a negative abundance gradient with respect to the galactic center, and uh, it evolved mono monotonously. If you assume that, then you can then you can do some things. So the the first time this was uh, this was proposed, this idea of chemical tagging was in two thousand two. Yeah. Uh, now the question is, does this work? Um, let me see. Okay. Almost done. Eh? Almost done. <laughs> um, so uh, one, let's first start with an easy example. Okay. Let's assume you have a database with lots of spectra. Mm, and you want to find all the very, very metaphor stars because they are easier in a way uh to analyze because fewer supernova have exploded uh, before they formed so it's easier to uh, yeah to say something about their origin and also they are more interesting because they they correspond to high redshift right so to the early evolution early galactic evolution or even they came from a different galaxy that merged within the, uh, with the milky way so uh so this is a this is an example from uh, previous spectroscopic survey array, and what you see here is 500,000 stars, the spectra of 500,000 stars condensed into this uh, two-dimensional map, okay? So it's more of a visualization problem. How do you visualize the, the similarity of different spectra uh, for many, many uh, if you have so many data. So that's, and that's why we use this uh, method called TSNE, uh, T stochastic, uh, T distributed stochastic. Uh, oh. <laughs> I forgot what it means. Something with neighbor 
whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, uh, you have to you have to imagine that this is like this is a similarity map. So so things that are close in this in this um, in this map to each other have similar spectra. Okay, so these are mainly stars, and so. Um, different uh, stellar types cluster in different region of this of this um, of this map and so the metropole stars would cluster here and here in this case and so so then uh, when you have this list of candidates that you're interested in you can go and do a better analysis of the of the spectrum that was the that was the purpose of this, of this paper and then you try to measure the, the equivalent width here with uh, with higher precision and you do a more refined analysis you send the targets to to bigger telescopes and follow them up and you get better data for them. um and now um just coming back to the idea of this strong chemical tagging uh, this is um i just want to show you some results from from this uh, paper by Laia Casa Michela, where we we uh, we went to this to the conceptual level and said, okay, um, if this strong chemical tagging uh, technique works or can work, then we just start from an idealized scenario. We only take stars that were born that we are sure were born in the same in the same uh, cluster. So we only take cluster members and we only take the best data that we can have. So high resolution, high signal to noise spectra. And then we try to see uh, in the abundance space if we can, if we can, if these things actually separate between them. Okay. Only red clump stars, so there's no stellar evolution, what they are all at the same evolutionary stage. This is also uh, important. Um, and then uh, we did uh, clustering with HDB scan on the abundance space, and this UMAP is similar to this uh, TSNE technique. It's just a uh, dimensionality reduction technique where you uh, visualize your, in this case, I think, fifteen-dimensional abundance space in two D. Okay, so things that are close here have, are similar in, in abundance, and. Um, and so the colors in this left in this left uh, plot correspond to uh, the groups found by the clustering algorithm. So this is a, a hierarchical clustering with noise. Um, and and on the right side, it's the same plot but colored by the by the actual cluster where we know the star is in this is in this physical open cluster. And you can see that there sometimes it works more or less. So you have 90% purity or so, and, uh, and sometimes even full completeness. But most of the time, even in this idealized case, there are no field stars, they're just cluster stars, they don't separate. Okay. Even with the best uh, techniques that we have at now, which is the uh, yeah, best clustering techniques that we have. So in some cases we get good homogeneity and in some cases good completeness, but but not homogeneity. Mm -hmm. And so then we went to a um another case which is more uh, realistic. So we took uh, the spectra from the Apogee survey, which is also high resolution, but not as high, so only 20,000. And uh, it contains mostly stars that are all over the galactic disk and only a few stars for which we knew that they were cluster members. Sorry. So you mentioned that they should be sent by the groups, but the TV calculation is even worse. So what is the meaning? How the star for the group if not for physical reason? Um the, the meaning is that the the abundance space in the galactic disk is so densely populated, so they are between one open cluster and the other, 
uh, the, the difference are very, very small because uh, many, too many supernovae exploded and so they are statistically evened out. You cannot detect um, in the thin disk at least, you cannot detect, um, <laughs> uh, you can, this, this idea of chemical tagging doesn't work. Maybe you you could, in principle, if the if the abundance errors were one uh, magnitude order of magnitude smaller, but then you are hitting the systematics uh, of of spectroscopy. So that's um, and so okay. So the, the the bottom line from this is that, it, of course, it also doesn't work <laughs> um, if you go to the worst scenario. Oops. Okay, so I um, just coming to the summary. I wanted to recommend this uh, recent paper. I think it came out last month or so uh, about machine learning in astronomy. So best practices of machine learning in astronomy, and um, so especially if you're just starting your whatever PhD or postdoc and you want to use this for the first time and wonder how, how, what are the things that I should do wrong and not, not do wrong, let's say. And then also, uh, if you're, I don't know, a referee of a paper that uses machine learning, then uh, these are also some good practices that they recommend in the appendix of that paper. Um, okay, so don't be afraid. <laughs> um, and, and yeah. If you can try to people who are also a bit more experienced, it's also how I learn. <laughs> and so to come to the end, I think the the more realistic cartoon is this: um, you start from hello world, you try to do some AI machine learning, blah, 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 and then you fall off the steps, <laughs> and actually first learn something about the data, about algorithms, and then. You can come back again to to applying machine learning techniques, and then wow, at some point uh, <laughs> you're going to learn uh, something about physics again. Okay, thank you very much, Frederick. Do we have questions? Sorry for taking so long. Eh? No, no, no. You did perfect on time. No worries. Well, you can do one to motivate the rest, and I will see if there's another one. Ah. It sometimes performs, uh, UMAP sometimes performs a bit better. Um, I don't think anybody knows really why. <laughs> But um, so, sometimes it's set, it, it's not so much dependent on the hyperparameter choices. So it, with TSME, you have some so-called hyperparameters that you have to test, uh, and that that sometimes make artificial clumps in your data. With UMAP, uh, it's not this hap doesn't happen so much, to my uh, in my experience. But many of these these uh, Choices are based on experience, like playing with the data, using, checking all the hyperparameters, and uh, and so yeah. And sometimes you can constrain the hyperparameters by looking at the literature from other people who have who use that algorithm. So TSME and UMAP are mostly just for visualization again. No? Sure. Use them for yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, but we use for the first. Um, you can see a little bit. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. Yeah, the good thing about this is it's unsupervised, so you can just apply it to to your data and see if there any anything pops out that you weren't even expecting. So just. I didn't have a question. That was just for the Now, the rule of thumb is that I showed you one of my favorite articles in the last year. Exactly what it is that the one about the possibility of the rise of the. Show that. Mm -hmm. 
the Apple's huge phones and tablets and now for the week now. Yeah. And so we stay now the user in reading that article will involve a lot of you know hands and work, right? So you have to analyze very interactively. Uh, do you have any ideas about how to do, do this using in a more, uh, let's say, automated fashion? You know, a good set of um, criteria that we could perhaps start looking for because this is one of the, of the pressing questions. Yeah. These days, because there are thousands, and it's very hard to know which one to do or not. Yeah. Yeah, we have a paper like the, the one by the real there in which you. You just remove the one that doesn't have this for some reason. We're going to go over that one with the same name. So, we if you read it manual for two things, yeah, the letter put in theory, you need at least a pretty large number of 14,000. 14,000, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't have a uh, in that paper. We tried to give uh minimal criteria in the 2020 paper, which is like. Okay, what can what do we know for sure about clusters? We know that they have uh, have a certain size, and that their velocity dispersion is uh, of a certain order. Okay, so if you find anything that doesn't obey those criteria, then you're dealing with something else. That's probably not an open cluster. Um, but uh, these are like minimal criteria. Criteria um, in the Alfred Castro's paper we. Train this classifier um, by looking at one by one different experts <laughs> on on color magnitude diagrams. So the color magnitude diagrams also have to look reason. But this is this can be you can be fooled, right? I can be fooled about the color magnitude diagram because there can be differential extinction. It can look completely. No, but there's a little bit important thing. The fact that if you perform a selection by parallax, you will almost yeah. always yeah, get yeah. something that looks like a spectrum of those kind of person. Yeah, yeah, sure. That's funny. Um, I think so. This this classifier thing was a bit um, improved by uh, the Emily Hunt paper. Um, but that's still like the, the main problem is she she finds she finds uh, ten thousand candidates or so. So seven thousand and zero, like five thousand, I more or less believe. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, this is has to has to continue for some years. There's a lot of people going to work on that. What the bad? Not going to be so. <laughs> okay. Another interesting question also in relation to what you want to do is how do you actually compare discoveries from one world to another? Because these are sparse objects that you know. Uh, People usually identify them by the region they occupy the by and and so if you use different let's say ray guy or whatever, yeah, yeah. It will not match them up so you will have to make it. Yeah, yeah, no, the cross match is also horrible. Um, I <laughs> I always use the opportunity not to be involved in this term. <laughs> no, do you have any, any recommendations in terms of you know, from research? Um, yeah, so when so Gaia is 5D and um, so five dimensional uh, subspace of the whole phase space. So if you have the six coordinate the rate velocity, then um, this is going to be a lot easier to distinguish uh, random random things from from actual clusters. And um, I think the prospects for the new Gaia data release, are quite good that we get at least some radio velocities, some well, many more radio velocities. Yeah. But yeah, no, no, I think this is something that you have to measure, go and measure. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what is the Gaia study? Future? No, no. <laughs> well, it's going to run out of fuel in 25, I think. And so that's when it's going to be uh, going to its trash orbit. And so, uh, but there are not. So we are now working on a new proposal. It's called Gaia Near, which would be uh, Gaia in the infrared. Post 2050. But then, if you combine those two, those two experiments, then you will have 
much longer baseline, so the proper motions will be super exquisite, and it's going to be so another order of magnitude uh, better. For all, and this is serving all of astrophysics uh, in the end. So it sounds boring astrometry, but it's actually not necessary. Okay. In which frequencies does Gaia C? Uh, the Gaia C, the Gaia CCD is in the optical. The one that, yeah, it's broad optical band white light, and so the near infrared is probably going to be uh, the K band, or well, yeah. so one point six micro. Okay. Two microns. Yeah. More questions? Yeah, if you come to the to, uh, to the dinner, then you can also ask questions. I think the oxygen level is dropping. <laughs> I can see it. <laughs> well, we can have we have time for one quick question if someone's willing to. Sorry, sorry, I can ask. So you mentioned that the parallax is not a very good parameter. I understand no, that gives you uh, error for. Ah uh, no, no, no. Uh, I think Andres' comment was about that. If you make a selection in parallax, then you will always naturally find uh, a sequence in the Hartman Russell diagram okay. because you select on distance, and then you will find nicely formed sequences. But yeah, so the most the most uh, uncertain uh, objects are at far distances. They're, they're the parallaxes are not very good. Because it's one over, no, parallax is one over distance. Oh, this is the, the Gaia parallax? Yeah, yeah, no, we don't have anything better. Yeah, that's what we have. Let's take this offline. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, yeah. If you enjoyed the video, like and subscribe.